didn't know. All right, good morning. Welcome to Crossroads Christian Fellowship. Um, it's funny, this morning I woke up and, you know, after pulling on an extra blanket last night and thinking of how cold it was, and uh, I, the first text I get in the morning is from my daughter who's in Ohio, and she's like, it's uh, a cool seven degrees, you know, and I'm looking at my thermometer and it's 56, right? And then uh, I come to church and talk to another friend here, 14 below, is that right? where they came from in Washington. So, you know, it's beautiful here. We, we think it's freezing because we have to put on socks, you know. <laughs> and uh, it's funny. But anyway, praise God, we're here together, and I'm looking forward to sharing the word today. Um, the title of today's message is What's in a Name? It's Ezra chapter 2. Uh, let's pray, and if you could pray in your hearts for me and, and with me. Father God, um, your word is so amazing, and it, it is so expansive that it's really hard sometimes to narrow down what to teach and what not to teach. Um, but we love you, God, and I just pray that the preparation that I've made will be a blessing. Um, I pray that I can accurately tell the things from your scriptures that you want us to hear this morning. And um, if I have any thoughts or any ideas that, that don't need to be said, and uh, just let them fall away, Lord, and let your truth come through. So I thank you. Thank you for each one here today, Lord. Um, we want to be a blessing to you as well. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so a real quick review, just to get you up to speed. Last week, we went through Ezra chapter 1, and kind of the main ideas in that was that God used Cyrus, who was a, um, he was a pagan king. He was not part of the, the Jewish um, race at all. He was not a believer. But God used him to accomplish his will in bringing the people back to their homeland in um, Judah. So God can use anyone, and he powerfully also fulfilled scriptures through Cyrus about um, what was going to happen with Israel. So I'm going to start today with a little bit of a timeline because I didn't, I didn't do this last week. And I kind of want to give you a, a perspective of the whole book of Ezra. When we talk about the Jews coming out of Babylon and back into um, their homeland, it's really, it's not like it happened all at once. It was an 80-year process. And so if we look at this, in 538 B.C., the first group of Jews returned to Judea with Zerubbabel as their governor, and that was roughly around 49,000 people. In 532 B.C., the temple building begins. 526, opposition stopped the building of the temple. In 520, the building of the temple restarts. In 516 B.C., the second Jewish temple was completed. In 483, the story of Esther begins. And I like to throw that in for context because a lot of people really like the story of Esther, of how... <laughs> It's just, it's great, her courage and how she stepped up in faith to fulfill what God wanted to happen. So just to know that this, this story about Esther um, takes place during this same time that we're looking at in the book of Ezra. And then in 458 BC, Ezra returns to Jerusalem with the second wave of approximately 2,000 Jews. So this is about an 80 year period and um, this uh, is the period for the repatriation of the Judah cities and Jerusalem. So if you've looked at chapter 2 of the book of Ezra, you'll notice that it's like almost solid names. It's just, it's one of those chapters that I have to admit when I've read through the Bible before, I kind of like just skim through because, it, you know, there's just so many names and, and it's hard to kind of even get a handle on it. So this was a little challenge for me, but the thing is there's a lot in here uh, about these names and about the meanings of the names and also the way they're organized. So that's what I want to share with you today. So we're going to start with um, Zerubbabel. 
and his name, he was the governor of, uh, he was also called Sheshbazar. So if you're reading through Ezra and you see Zerubbabel and then you see Sheshbazar, same person. Uh, Sheshbazar is the Babylonian name they gave him. It means descended of Babylon. So he would some t sometimes also be called the Tirshata, which is the Persian name for governor. He was born, sorry, I'm trying to get the, stop that noise. Is that all right? Okay. He was born in Babylon as a child of the um, exiled generation. He was also a descendant of King David. So the genealogies are gonna be real important. They were extremely important in the Jewish tradition. So when we look at the background of Zerubbabel, we go back to uh, First Chronicles 3.1. It says, now these were the sons of David, which were born unto him in Hebron. The first Amnon of Ahinoam, the Jezreelitis, the second Daniel of Abigail, the Carmelitis, and then there's a whole lot of verses, but as we continue through, we get to verse 19, which says, and the sons of Hedaiah were Zerubbabel and Shimei, and the sons of Zerubbabel, Meshulam and Hananiah, and Shelamith, their sister. So again, descended from King David, which also puts him in the line of genealogy through which um, Jesus Christ would be born. So it's kind of interesting to see him in this book. His name, um, the other person that we're gonna look at closely is Ezra the priest, and his priest, scribe, his name means help. He was also born in Babylon. His official title would be priest and scribe, and when he returned to Judea with the second wave of Jews, he would serve as governor of Judah. His great-grandfather was Hilkiah, and uh, we're gonna look at that scripture in Second Chronicles 34, 14 and 15. It says, and when they brought out the money that was brought into the house of the Lord, Hilkiah the priest found a book of the law of the Lord given by Moses. And Hilkiah answered and said to Shephan, the scribe, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah delivered the book to Shephan. This um, was during the time of Josiah, the king. And yeah, Josiah, we have one here. He was one of the few kings, if you read 1 Kings and First and Second Chronicles and you read about what was going on, Josiah was one of the only kings that they have anything good to say about. You're gonna help me out a little? Oh. All right. Yeah, that'll probably, will that get rid of all that and other weird noises? Thank you. So yeah, as I was saying, um, Josiah was one of the only good kings of Israel. Um, so when this was brought out, oh, this is going to, sorry. So let's read about Josiah a little bit. It says, and he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, and walked in the ways of David his father, and declined neither to the right hand nor to the left. So when Hilkiah, we're going back remembering, this is, the, um, this is Ezra's ancestor. When Hilkiah found this book of the law and it was brought out to King Josiah, it led to this great revival and the people repented and returned to the Lord and continued to serve the Lord all the days of Josiah. So this heritage would no doubt have a strong influence on Ezra and it gave him a sense of family name to live up to. He's credited with the founding of the great synagogue, the synod of learned Jewish scholars. This led to the settlement of the Hebrew sacred scriptures. So at this time in history, it would be compiled into the arrangement of law, the prophets, and the writings. Ezra was also instrumental in the transition from the old Hebrew script to the new script with uh, square characters. So they would be able to be a lot more um, accountable in terms of seeing them, counting them, measuring the spacing of them. So Ezra also compiled the books of First and Second Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, 
and he was a leader in the institution of local synagogues. So as we go back to this question, what's in a name? Boy, we have to take a deep breath here. There's a lot of names we're going to read. Uh, we'll begin to go through the chapter, which is 70 verses of sometimes, well, I should say always hard to pronounce names. And other, we'll, we'll see what other nuggets we can find. But I have to admit, I'm not a Hebrew speaker. Um, I'll do my best. So if there's any Hebrew speaking coaches out there afterward and you're cringing, you can come in and talk to me after, <laughs> give me some lessons. Um, so we already looked at some of the relevant history. Uh, so we'll now be looking at doctrine and inspiration. So here we go. Now these are the children of the province that went up out of the captivity, of those which had been carried away, whom Nebuchadnezzar the king of Babylon had carried away into Babylon, and came unto Jerusalem and Judah, every one unto his city, which came with Zerubbabel, Joshua, Nehemiah, Zeruiah, Reeliah, Mordecai, Bilshan, Mispar, Bigvai, Rehum, Baana, the number of the men of the people of Israel. I'm going to take a, a minute here and look at the significance of some of, the, some of these first names because it's very instructive to us. First, after Zerubbabel, is Joshua. The Hebrew meaning, he is saved. When we think of Yeshua, we also think of Joshua. We also think of Yeshua, Jesus. Next is, um, we're going to definitely revisit that a little bit more later. Uh, the next is Nehemiah, which means Jehovah comforts. Next, Sariah, meaning Jehovah is ruler. And Re'eliah, meaning bearer of Jehovah. So think of the importance to the nation of Israel of these meanings. In Yeshua, there is salvation. Nehemiah, Nehemiah reminds us it is God who comforts. The name Sariah tells them, um, tells them Jehovah God is their ruler. And Re'eliah, bearer of Jehovah, is a reminder to always be aware that God is present with them. The next thing that we'll see as we dive into this list of names is that they are arranged by families and groups. God has always been interested in families and relationships with them under his rule. The other way the names are listed is by their function and roles in the Jewish society. And I'll tell you again in advance, we're going to be reading through a lot of names, over 30 verses. I'm to expound on every name. If you're interested, um, you can talk to me later. I would like to recommend, though, for your own personal study, it's pretty cool. Um, there are some really good Bible apps. The, some I like to use are Logos. Uh, Bible software, Blue Letter Bible, and one called Literal Word. All have free apps, and uh, you can use them on a variety of devices. The other thing I noticed as I started to study some of these names is that as an English-speaking Christian church, we've been used to hearing a lot of these names for years pronounced in an English way. Um, so I'm going to leave the Hebrew to someone else, and I'm going to read them as I would read them in English. So thank you. <laughs> Ezra 2, 3. Um, here we go. The children of Parash, 2,172. Children of Shephatiah, 370. I'm sorry, I'm having a hard time seeing there. The children of Ra, 770 and 5. Children of Pahath Mohab, of the children of Yeshua and Joab, 2,812. The children of Elam, 1,254. We're going to continue. The children of Zatu, 940 and 5. Children of Zakai, 703 score. The children of Bani, 640 and 2. The children of Baibal, 620 and 3. The children of Asgad, 1,200. 20 and 2, the children of Adonikam, 660 and 6, children of Bigvai, 2050 and 6, children of Adin, 450 and 4, children of Ater, 
Hezekiah 90 and 8. The children of Bezai, 320 and 3. The children of Jorah, 112. The children of Hashem, 220 and 3. Children of Gibeah, 90 and 5. Children of Bethlehem, 120 and 3. The men of Netophah, 50 and 6. The men of Anathoth, 120 and 8. Children of Asmaveth, 42. The children of Kirjath Arim, Shepherah, and Beerath. 743. The children of Ramah and Geba, 620 and 1. The men of Michmas, 120 and 2. The men of Bethel and Ai, 220 and 3. The children of Nebo, 50 and 2. The children of Magvish, 150 and 6. The children of the other Alam, 1,250 and 4. The children of Harim, 320. The children of Lod, Hadid, and Ono, 720 and 5. The children of Jericho, 340 and 5. The children of Sana'a, 3,630. All right, this completes the general list of people by their families. I kind of, I was kind of thinking, man, should I just not read all of those? <laughs> because you know, I don't know how many of you are still with me now. I hope you're still awake. Um, but, you know, I just, I just felt like we don't want to skip anything in the Word of God. So I felt like uh, the, the right thing to do was to read through all of them. So as we begin to look at significant groups in the remaining verses, it's not by chance that the first group is the priests. As descendants of Aaron, the brother of Moses, and appointed to special duties under the law, they were held to the highest standard of pedigree and behavior. The priests also had a strong position of influence and control in governance of the Jewish people. This put them in a higher position than even the governor. But what I think is most important is they were responsible for the sacrifices and the Jewish feasts that all point to the atonement and the salvation and the coming of Jesus Christ. And that's why I think they're listed first in this order. Jesus Christ. And if you've ever been around me, you know that um, if I haven't said it already today, he is the very central figure of the whole Bible. The word of God himself, amen? So of course, their names and their lineage were extremely important to their qualifications to serve the people and make judgments concerning them. So let's read their names. The priests, the children of Jediah of the house of Jeshua, 970 and three. The children of Emer, 1,050 and two. The children of Pashur, 1,240 and seven. The children of Harim, 1,017. Notice how many priests there are. When we add this up, it's 4,289 priests. If we look at the ratio of the total number of people that we stated earlier of around 49,000, we get a ratio of about one priest for every 11.5 people. I like that 0.5 part, right? This half person shows us that no matter how small a person is, they need ministry. Um, do you guys remember the Dr. Seuss story about Horton Hears a Who? I mean, that may be my generation or children's story, but they did a TV thing on it too. And I, I love the kind of the ending and the theme of that whole story was a person's a person, no matter how small, right? So I don't know, that popped into my head when I saw the 11.5 people. I thought about that little person. Um, we could also go down the, the rabbit trail of um, pre-born people. <coughs> but I think uh, that discussion will wait for another time. But it shows me how important that leadership is also in God's work. It also confirms to me that we need more leaders in our church to carry on healthy ministry. The next major group is the Levites. The Levites were religious leaders descended from Levi, who was the sixth son of Jacob and Leah. Levi was also the great-grandfather 
of Aaron, Moses, and Miriam. Again, we see names being so important to the Jewish structure of society. Though not priests under the line of Aaron, the Levites had special religious duties and political influence. Um, there's a lot more to say about the Levites, and some of you might be, I don't know if it enters your mind, how the Levites were one of the tribes that did not receive an inheritance of land among the other tribes in Judah. And um, that's another whole study in itself. I would encourage you to check it out. If you want to know why they didn't receive an inheritance, um, I would suggest reading these chapters, Genesis 34 and especially uh, Genesis 49, because it tells why they didn't receive an inheritance. And it's kind of a long story, and it's pretty complicated, but um, I encourage you to do some study on that. I think what you find might be pretty amazing. Then consider the Levites in the role in their time of Jesus Christ. This is also connected with Genesis 34 and 49. Consider their role before Jesus Christ was crucified. That's a little clue. So as we continue, we're going to read the names of the Levites. The Levites, the children of Joshua and Cogniel, of the children of Hodaviah, 70 and 4. The singers, the children of Asaph, 120 and 8. The children of the porters, the children of Shalom, the children of Ater, the children of Taman, the children of Akub, the children of Hatita, the children of Shobai, in all, and hundred and thirty-nine. So I love how these lists are organized in God's word. First the leaders, then the priests, the Levites, and the next group is the Nethanim, if you're following along in Ezra chapter 2. So the Nethanim, um, a lot of people, uh, including myself, after reading the Bible for quite a few years, didn't, we don't know who the Nethanim are. It's kind of one of those funny names. We read it and go on. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about where the Nethanim came from, who they are, and what their roles were. So these were non-Jews. They were given to the Levites to serve in menial labor as the Levites carried out their duties. Some scholars believe that this started um, when Israel conquered the Midianites while they were still under the direction of Moses. So going way back, um, in Numbers 31, verses 1 and 2, uh, this was a command to Moses. The Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, Avenge the children of Israel of the Midianites. Afterward shalt thou be gathered unto thy people. So this is one of Moses' last directives of God, was to go in and destroy the, Mid the Midianites. After Israel's victory, the booty was divided. So um, it was bought back, and it was divided among those that went and fought and those that stayed behind. So in Numbers 31.47, it says, and I'll, I'll tell you how this connects in a minute. 3147, even the children of Israel's half, Moses took one portion of 50, both of man and of beast, and gave them unto the Levites, which kept charge of the tabernacle of the Lord, as the Lord commanded Moses. So this is this, the first mention of another outside people group being given to the Levites to serve in their duties. Later, um, during Joshua's conquest, of the land that God was given to Israel, the Gibeonites were also taken into service to the Levites after they tricked Joshua into a treaty to keep them from being destroyed. So in Joshua 9, 3, and 4, it says, And when the inhabitants of Gibeon heard what Joshua had done unto Jericho and to Ai, they did work wilily. That's a tricky word, wilily, which means basically they were deceitful and crafty and, and wily coyote. So they went in um, and acted like they were ambassadors, took old sacks upon their asses and wine bottles, old and rent and bound up. So these Gibeonites, they came to the leaders of Israel because they just heard th this group of people's coming in, they're wiping out everybody. And so they went in there, 
They pretended like they had traveled from a far land. You know, they had all this old stuff and moldy bread and everything. And they came begging for mercy and help from Israel. And they actually got the leaders of Israel to swear that they wouldn't destroy them. And it says in the text that three days after three days, they found out that these guys were actually their neighbors. So they were living in the territory that um, Israel that uh, was taking over. But because the oath that was made and because the leaders of Israel feared God, they, they would not destroy them. So this was another group of people. And this is probably the, the majority of people that were taken in as the Nethanim, because all these people were forced to be servants to Israel. I guess the Gibeonites decided it was probably a better deal to be slaves than to be completely annihilated. So this is, uh, this is where the Nethanim came from. It says, and Joshua made them that day hewers of wood and drawers of water for the congregation and for the altar of the Lord, even unto this day in the place which he would choose. So over generations, the Nethanim would be assimilated into the Jewish culture, and they may have adopted the faith. Um, we don't know that. They may have adopted faith in the God of Israel. Whether they did or not, they were an important group in the service of the temple and in supporting the duties of the Levites and the priests. Um, it's clear that they were also taken into captivity with Judah. So they were taken into Babylon, and they came back with the Jews when they returned to their land. And they lived in their own cities among the Jews. So we're going to read the How we're on. The Nethanims, the children of Ziha, the children of Hasufa, the children of Tabaoth, the children of Karos, the children of Siaha, children of Padan, the children of Leba, the children of Hagabah, the children of Akub, the children of Hakab, the children of Shammai, the children of Hanan, the children of Gedel, the children of Gahar, the children of Re'eah, the children of Rezin, the children of Nekoda, the children of Gazam, the children of Uzzah, the children of Pasea, the children of Besai, the children of Azna, the children of Mehunim, the children of Nephesim, the children of Bakbuk, the children of Hakufa, the children of Harhur, the children of Basluth, the children of Mehida, the children of Harsha, the children of Barkos, the children of Sisera, the children of Thama, the children of Neziah, the children of Hatufa. Yay, I did it. <laughs> Uh, this is the part that made me the most nervous preparing about this, is, is having to read all these names. Um, praise God. So similar to the Nethanim that were listed as Solomon's servants, most scholars believe that these servants were also from other people groups that came into the culture of Israel as foreign proselytes, meaning that they were converted into Judaism and became part of their culture. So we have the children of Solomon's servants. The children of Solomon's servants, the children of Sotai, the children of Sopharath, the children of Peruda, the children of Ja'ala, the children of Darkan, the children of Gedel, the children of Shephatiah, the children of Hatil, the children of Pochereth, of Zedan, the children of Ami, all the Nethanims and the children of Solomon's servants were 390 and two. So again, by that number, you know, hearing that 392 compared to the overall population that came back of around 49,000 kind of gives you a little bit more perspective of how many of these people there were in relation to the, the total group. So this last group of people that uh, we're going to read, it's listed by name, and it's kind of interesting. In fact, it's very interesting to me that um, they were unable to show their genealogy. So we'll read about them and then I have a little bit of something to talk about that. Um, and these were they that went up from Tel Melah, Tel Harsa, Sharob, Adan, and Emer, 
but they could not show their father's house and their seed, whether they were of Israel. The children of Deliah, the children of Tobiah, the children of Nekoda, 652. The children of the priests, the children of Habiah, the children of Kaz, the children of Barzillai, which took a wife of the daughters of Barzillai the Gileadite and was called after their name. These sought their register among that that were reckoned by genealogy, but they were not found. Therefore, they were as polluted from the priesthood. And the Tirshathah said to them that they should not eat of the most holy things till there stood up a priest with Urim and Thummim. Um, I'm going to mention this. I did look up the pronunciation of this because we read this all the time, the Urim and the Thummim. And um, the closest, I'll try the best I can. But what I got was it's more like Ur and Tom would be the more correct Hebrew pronunciation. So this concludes the long lists of names and the groups they represent. We'll take a brief look at the Ur and Tom mentioned above. Um, these were objects that were kept in the breastplate of the high priest from the time of Aaron. The never really describes in the Bible exactly how they were used but it's believed that they, well, we know they were used for judgment and to discern the will of the Lord. Um, something like casting lots or throwing dice to, to discern. But what we do know is they were small enough to fit in that breastplate that the high priest wore. So they were something that could be taken out like that. And um, so in this case, the priest would consult the Ur and the Tom to determine the acceptable roles for those without adequate evidence of their genealogy. So I'm gonna just, this talks about how this tradition started way back in Exodus with Aaron, the first priest. It says, and thou shalt put in the breastplate of judgment, the Urim and the Thum, and they shall be upon Aaron's heart when he goeth in before the Lord. And Aaron shall bear the judgment of the children of Israel upon his heart before the Lord continually. So in that statement, we're hearing that they were used also for judgment. Um, so this would be a, an application of that in this case. And here's another, another uh, passage that talks about how these were used. He shall stand before Eliezer the priest, who shall ask counsel for him after the judgment of Urim before the Lord. And at his word they shall go out, and at his word they shall come in both he and all the children of Israel with him, even all the congregation. So this is just another scripture that talks about how they would use it to discern the will of God. Okay, next we have a brief summary of all the groups of people. It says the whole congregation together was 40 and 2,303 score besides their servants and their maids, of whom there were 7,350 and seven. And there were among them 200 singing men and women. So this adds up to about 49,000. And I like that it says, um, it notes that they're singing men and women. So if you remember, if you were here last week, I, th I think I said there was about 40,000. Uh, this gives us a little bit more accurate um, numbers of all the people that came back. And I appreciate the fact that they have a record of all the singing men and women. Um, this is a, it's something that's been part of our interaction with God ever since the beginning of creation. And some of you are gifted in singing. It's been, it's been part of life, it's a gift that God has given us when we open our mouth and express our worship to him through song. Um, it was originally the job of Lucifer. He was the head of worship leading. Um, it says, thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering. The sardius, topaz, and the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, and the jasper the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, 
and gold. The workmanship of thy tablets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee the day thou, thou was created. So we all have pipes, right? We have our wind pipes. This is um, what we use to breathe and what we use to sing, to speak. And it said that he was perfect in the way he was created to express worship to God. But after Satan's fall, it says he was perfect in the days from the day thou was created till iniquity was found in thee. After Satan's fall, God made man and God blessed them and God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. So what was lost from worship with Satan and about a third of the angels that followed him, God sent man to replenish. It's our job to, to give God worship. So if you allow that instrument that God has given you to flow with the breath of life, which has also been given to you by God, it's a sweet sound to the Lord. It's part of his design from the beginning of creation. We're privileged and blessed to be able to participate in this. The returning to our text, we'll see that the animals were even numbered. So if you guys are animal lovers, you should love this part. God loves animals. He created them. And in this context, they were important as property and as a means to wealth. It says, their horses were 730 and 6, their mules 240 and 5, their camels 430 and 5, their asses 6,720. Okay, just a couple more verses in this chapter and then we'll get into some of the teaching of and some of the chief of the fathers, when they came to the house of the Lord, which is at Jerusalem, offered freely for the house of God to set it up in its place. They gave after their ability unto the treasure of the work threescore, one thousand drams of gold, five thousand pounds of silver, and one hundred priest garments. This was a huge amount of money, even in that time. So an important note about this, I'm not going to get into trying to translate that into our dollars today, but an important here note in this is that they gave willingly, and it's a reflection of the faith and the devotion they had toward God's work. And finally, so the priests and the Levites and some of the people and the singers and the porters and the Nethinims dwelt in their cities, all Israel in their cities. So this is the last verse of this chapter. In this that we see that only some, it says some of the people returned. And if we went back to what I had told you last week about a million people that were living in Babylon, this represents about 5%. It's about 5% of the people returned to their homeland and the rest of them stayed in Babylon. Okay, so I'm gonna draw out some history, some doctrine, and, and hopefully some inspiration from this for you. To review this passage, we need to remember that this was the beginning of an 80-year process, and it's also the end of Israel as a free theocracy, meaning prior to this, they were ruled by God, they were under the rule of God without hindrance from other nations. After they gave up their allegiance to God, went into captivity and were punished, from that point on, they would be plagued by other nations around them. They had intermarried. They had um, allowed other nations that were supposed to be wiped out completely to coexist around them. And so for the rest of the history of Israel, to today, as you can see, they're going to be continually harassed by the nations around them. But nevertheless, God would continue to be their God and will perform his goodwill toward Israel in due time. At the time of this book, they already had the prophecy and the hope of the Messiah. They just didn't know who he was. 
So in doctrine, as we consider doctrine in this chapter, we can see several things. First, as this book was primarily written to Israel, we see how important names are for the heritage of God. We have nearly 70 verses telling us the names of real historical people and have some explanation of their genealogy because it defines the roles that they had and their future with God. We even see in verses 59 through 63 that some were not found in the reckoning of the genealogy. Therefore, they were considered polluted and they were held back from certain aspects of the priesthood. They were not allowed to partake or eat of the most holy things. They would have to stand up before a priest with the Ur and Tom to decide their lot in life, the judgment of the priest, hopefully through God. This is a form of divine judgment. We can also see from the meaning of names and the key leaders a description of God. So as we look at Ezra, we hear help, Joshua, salvation, Nehemiah, comfort, Seariah, ruler, and Re'eliah, bearer of Jehovah. The big picture of this chapter shows us that Yeshua, leading the captives out of captivity, it's a foreshadowing how Israel will eventually be saved by coming to faith in Jesus Christ. It's only through Jesus Christ that salvation is found. Another aspect is the perfect order that all the people of Israel are described. God is a God of order and values all people in the roles they are appointed to. Lastly, it shows that not all will come. Some will prefer to stay and put all their trust in Babylon, the world system. For us, uh, we can get some inspiration and application out of this. Some of the things we can learn from this passage is how important our names are to God. For the Jew, genealogy and heritage are so important. Some were excluded from partaking in the most holy things. Could you imagine if we had to justify ourselves based on who our parents were or their parents or all of our ancestors? Can you imagine if you traced your DNA all the way back and you found out that you were a descendant of Esau or Ham, which were um, their genealogies both gave rise to enemies of Israel, which are continuing to be their enemies today. What if you traced your genealogy and found that? And that was your qualification to be a person of God. We'd be in trouble. Um, and I have to say, if not for Jesus Christ, right? Um, when Paul was talking to King Agrippa and describing his own commission, Paul quotes Jesus as saying, so this is more application. This is what Jesus, uh, what um, Jesus told Paul. He's sending him to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me, Jesus Christ speaking, only faith in him. So now our forgiveness of sins and our inheritance is by faith in Jesus. This was a command from Jesus to Paul, Jews first. So this was a message for the Jews, not just for us. And then after that to the Gentiles, us. For us, the question is, are we part of that promise? And where is our name? Is your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life? We also see that God desires all kinds of roles and service in his nation. For us, we have New Testament, Romans 12. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we, being many, are one body in Christ, and every one members of another. As we saw in the book of Ezra, how God supplies for his work, we must remember to give willingly because we love and serve an almighty God. 
we don't give to receive anything from God. And I'm going to speak a little, and I, I'm going to preface this by saying I'm not up here trying to preach to you to give more or to give money. That's not what this message is about. It's about the heart. But I was reminded by one of the guys in our Bible study the other night. He was saying how, you know, he's, a, wants, he's adopting this, the practice of tithing. And he was reminding us that a lot of you, I'm sure, have heard this, that if we give 10%, we're basically s we're keeping 90% of what is God anyway, right? And so some people, some people decide they want to give more, some less. It's really a, f a reflection of your faith, and your faith is based on what you ask God for. So if you ask God for more faith, he's going to allow you to give whatever you give. It's going to be willing, and it's going to be a blessing for you to give. God doesn't need our money. Uh, everybody says that. Um, but I do want to, uh, it's a really personal thing. So I want to go on, and there's some other application here. It's on a little bit deeper layer, and it's an interpretation that there's something amazing in this first group going on. Consider this. The first name listed after Zerubbabel is Joshua. He is leading the captives out of captivity. And like Joshua, he's leading them into the land that God gave them. When Jesus came, he quoted this scripture from Isaiah. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. So we see the Jews coming out of captivity. But Jesus read this to the Jews at his time. This was after, way after this book of Ezra took place. In Ezra, Joshua led Israel out of captivity back to their land. We also know in 1 Peter this truth to us. For this cause was the gospel preached also to them that are dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but living according to God in the spirit. We're told that when Jesus Christ died and he was in the ground, he descended into the lower parts where all the souls, where Abraham's bosom were, the souls that died and were waiting resurrection. He went and preached to them the prison that they might be a judge according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the spirit. It also says in Ephesians, wherewith he said, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended, what is it? But that he first descended into the lower parts of the earth. So we know that these Jews that died from the time of Ezra they were faithful. If they were in Abraham's bosom waiting erection, they would meet Jesus Christ. And he came and preached to them. And this is uh, the last verse that I have to share today. Also in Ephesians 3. It says, Whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto this holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. So Israel was all about the heritage and the, to be heirs of the kingdom of God. We have been included by what Jesus Christ has done for us. We are now heirs to all of the blessings that God has for us in eternity. So my conclusion is that it's always been Jesus that's at the center of all the religious traditions of Israel. He's still at the center of salvation in this church age for Israel and for us. But all parts are important to God. Everyone has a place in God's plan either for salvation or separation from God. And I'll leave you with the question, where will your name be found 
when the books are opened. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for this passage in Ezra today. I thank you that we see Jesus all the way through it. And I thank you, God, that we are included in all your promise, all of your heritage, Lord, that we are now included because of Jesus Christ. Lord, help us to remember these things. Help us to love your word, to dig in and to look for you and to try to find you on every page. Thank you, God, for the people here today. May you stir up their hearts just the way you stirred up the kings to follow you and to love you and to be found in you. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.